Thank you, honey. And uh, ladies, I guess I can say that in church. <laughs> Doesn't the church look so nice? Anna, you did a great job celebrating and just kind of sprucing things up. Thank you. And by the way, it's Anna's birthday. She told me it was yesterday, but on my calendar it says today, so maybe you get two this year. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome back to our ser- sermon series on the book of Hebrews that we started last week. Um, last week, I gave a very long introduction. If you missed any of that information and would like that, there were copies out there on the table, and uh, when I came in uh, right before the service, some of you have already helped yourself to them, so that's great. If I need to make more, let me know. So um, you may not care about all that information, but the video kind of highlighted those. Today, I am going to take a, a clue from the writer of Hebrews. We're not going to have a long introduction. And so today, we're going to jump right in. So please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. And for the most part, we're going to skip over chapter 2, the bulk of chapter 2. But uh, it wouldn't be good for me to just skip over an entire chapter. So let me give you a brief summary of this passage of Scripture. Um, in Hebrews chapter 2... The author began to give a what I call a tempered warning. It is a warning, but it's tempered. <clears throat> His warnings will get more severe as they go through as he goes through this book. Uh, Hebrews chapter two begins with the first of five major warning passages about something about removing or re- abandoning your faith, abandoning the faith or or forsaking your faith, but uh, this first one is somewhat tempered. He starts off by saying, therefore, and in biblical training, I was always told, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to ask your que- yourself the question, why is it there for? What, what's the purpose of this? Well, he's going to tie everything he's going to talk about in chapter 2 Back to chapter 1. So he's been talking about how great a salvation we have. How much greater Jesus is in chapter 1. Therefore, because of that, we hear these words. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Again, one of the the very first of the five warnings. And what you can't see here in the English is... In the Greek, it's very obvious. In the, in the original language, there are two nautical verbs. You know what nautical means? It means boating. There's boating verbs here. The first one, the first verb is to pay close atten- pay attention. That, that looks like a, a pretty clear, okay, he's just telling you to pay attention. There is so much more depth in that word in the original language. It's linked to the adverb much closer. And the first word pay attention really means to hold firmly. It's a nautical term as a ship would drop an anchor to hold itself in port so it wouldn't drift out to sea. So you need to hold firm to something. You need to drop your anchor connecting to the second uh, uh, verb, which a nautical verb, which is to drift away. Then it makes sense, right? Because If we're drifting away, why would we drift away and not just pay attention? If we drop our anchor, if we hold fast to what has been said about Jesus, then we won't drift away. It's also interesting that he's got a word, lest we. Again, it's one of those, in the original language, there's such a depth to what does that mean? It is a compound word that means we need to be careful that it doesn't happen right now. Okay, so we need to make sure we need to be dropping anchor right now so that we don't drift away from the the salvation that the Lord has provided. Also, I want you to notice here that the pronoun that he is using here is something that he's going to come back to. Again, we believe in the inerrant word of God and we believe that every word of God is important. Pronouns are important. The pronoun here is what he's going to use later on in chapter 3. We, plural, we, unless we drift away. He's not talking about an individual. Can an individual drift away from the truth? Yes, absolutely, they can drift away. 
But that's not what he's talking about here. He says we need to drop anchor as a people of God or in application as a church of God. We need to drop anchor and be rooted in God's word lest we as a church drift away. We drift away. Then he spends the rest of chapter 2 talking about the humanity of the Son, the Son of God, who is so much better than, so much more supreme than anyone else in the Old Testament. All right? So now we can go into chapter 3. So turn over to chapter 3. I think this one uh, is the most influential. Well, I want you to, I want to ask this question. Who do you, when you think of the most influential person that you know, who comes to mind? Who, who do you picture in your, in your head? The most influential, most dedicated follower of Jesus that you know of. Who does that, who does that represent in your mind? Could be a grandmother. In my life, it was a grandmother who prayed for her sons and her, her children and her grandsons and grandchildren. Um, this would be the person that prays all the time. And you know that when they pray and they pray for you, God listens and he answers their prayer. You know, it could be a friend or a spouse that you say, one day I want to be as spiritual as they are. It could be you know, that celebrity TV pastor or internet pastor. I'm sure it's not me, but you know, I'm sure that you're, there's someone in your mind that when you think of, this is the most spiritual person that I know, and one day I would like to reach their level of spirituality. Here's what the passage is going to talk about here in just a little bit. All those people may be great, but they don't hold a candle to Jesus. Jesus is the most supreme. He is far better, and I know that might sound harsh, that might seem somewhat mean-spirited. No one can compare to Jesus. No one. Today, what he is about to introduce is to them, to the Hebrew people, the one they looked up to the most was a guy named Moses. Moses was their ancient hero. He was superior than all the other ones. Abraham, we're going to talk about he, you know, later, but Moses was their guy. But Jesus is superior. All right, with that, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you give us your word so that we can know you, we can know what you think, we can know what you want us to think and how you want us to live. And today, as we dive into some of the early difficult passages in this book of Hebrews, help us to see that your word is important and what you give us in your word is so clearly defined and so clearly explained when we understand what it says in the context. Lord, I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds to receive this word as it's from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Renee and I have lived in a lot of different houses in our 40 years of marriage, haven't we? We've lived in small teeny towns, teeny houses. We lived in one house in Bible college. It had three rooms and a bathroom, all right? So three rooms is all the, all the house had. I mean, it was like an apartment, but it was a house. We even lived in a mobile home, you know, for, for a year on our, on our mom's farm. We live in a house now that we've lived in for 25 years that we're grateful that was been paid off for probably five years. And this house is probably by far our favorite house. We've created a great number of memories in this house. We've seen God do great work in this house. It's not perfect. No house is perfect. All right. But it's home for us. Here's one thing that I found. Go ahead and put up those picture, that picture, Jen. Houses come in many different sizes and shapes and kind of things. And when you look at that, I mean, you may live in a high-rise apartment. You may live in a mansion. All houses have a few things in common. All houses have a designer. Somebody designed that building. Somebody planned it out. Some architect drew out some drawings at some point, maybe nowadays on a CAD, but at some point they drew out a design for that house. And they knew where every wall and every, every uh, fixture and every, every outlet was going to be, and they had a grand plan. 
Then there was the next guy who came along, and he was the builder. He had to take those blueprints and make that thing into reality. And then, after the designer and builder come along, then there's the occupant. Now, the occupant may be the owner, you know, along with the bank usually, but maybe it's a renter. Somebody is going to come live in that home, in that building. Here's one thing that I found out, and I think you'll probably agree. In the design phase, the designer is most important. In the building phase, the builder is the most important. But after the building is built, who's the most important person for that building? Whoever lives there, the occupant, the owner or the renter or whoever is living there. And no longer do you go by that house and say, well, so-and-so designed that house or so-and-so built that house. And you may know that, but you normally drive by houses and you say, so-and-so lives there. That's where they live. That's their home. So here's something that I've learned. The occupant of the house is always the most important. In the long run, the occupant is the one that is most, most important. In God's house, he is all three. He is the designer, he's the builder, he's the occupant. And that is what the author of Hebrews is going to come back to here in a little bit. He is all three. And just like any good attorney, any good debater, any good preacher, the author of Hebrews is going to build his case or build his sermon on this premise that the occupant is the most important person in the house or of the house. Once again, he's going to go back to this supremacy, this who is the best. And he's going to go back to Jesus is supreme, and he's going to use their hero, Moses. And so that's my first point today. The superiority or the superior, he's superior to Moses. To these Jewish people, Abraham and Moses were their ancient top heroes. They were their national, national guys. They were the guys that David to a lesser extent, but when you talk when you see how Jesus talked to the people of his day, they always claimed Father Abraham is their ancestor, and Moses has said. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So to the Jewish people, Moses was the guy. If we want truth, if we want the best example of a faithful servant of God, Moses is the man. But Jesus is far superior than Moses. Verse 1 says this. Again, he begins with, therefore, everything that chapter 2 says, therefore, holy brothers, holy the word is sancti- we get the word sanctified from or set apart. They are holy because Jesus has made them such. Obviously, ladies, he does include women here. This is the generic term for man or mankind. This is a compound word to describe followers of Jesus. It is the only place in the New Testament that Christians are called holy brothers or holy people. Now, yes, he will use the word holy in other places, but never as a compound holy brothers. It's the only place. They are holy brothers because you have shared in the heavenly calling. You are companions. You are partakers of the call. And here's something interesting. It says that you're, it's a heavenly calling. So it's either, either one of these two interpretations will work. It is a call to heaven or is a call from heaven? Get that? Our calling is being, we are called to heaven or we are, their call is from heaven to follow Jesus. One of the two, either one of those makes sense and either of those fit with the original language. But then he says, the, he gives the command. In this chapter, here's the command. Consider. You English people, it's the imperative. It's the command to do something. Consider, let us consider Jesus. All right, what does he want us to consider? Again, he's going to use a term. He's used five terms for Jesus so far. This is now the next one, apostle. This is the fifth title that he has given to Jesus. He is an apostle, one who is sent forth. This is the only place in the New Testament that Jesus is called an apostle. 
Now, we know that Jesus had 12 apostles, but this is Jesus is God's apostle. God's appointed sent forth one. Now, obviously, in the New Testament, Jesus is sent from God, but this is the only place that he's given that title. He's already used the word uh, title high priest, and that's what he goes to next, the apostle and high priest of our confession. I liked what one commentator said. He said, apostle refers to Jesus' earthly function. He was sent forth from God to man. And the high priestly function is what he does in heaven still to this day. Verse 2, who, that is Jesus, was faithful to him, that's God, who appointed him. Jesus is faithful to God because God appointed him to do something. Now the author is going to give that illustration about that house that I talked about a few minutes ago. Just as Moses was also faithful in God's house, okay, once again, we got a word here that can mean a couple of different things. House can mean a building, but it can also mean a household. It can mean a family. You have a household. We are the household of Grace Evangelical Church. We're a family. You have a household in, that lives in your house. So either of these firm, ter terms can be applied here. If, he's, if he is really referring to a building, a house, then he's going to refer to the tabernacle of the Old Testament, not the temple. You know, the temple is what you know, Solomon built and then Herod built and Zerubbabel built before that. But Moses was faithful in God's tabernacle, if it's a building, but if it's his household, if that's what the word means, then it means God's priestly house. God's, you know, the, the people that function and serve God in his house. Verse 3, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every builder has, is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And the author pulls no punches. He just gets right to the point. You know, you think Moses is great. You think Moses is cool. Jesus is better. And that's what he's saying. Moses, Moses doesn't hold a candle to Jesus. Jesus has more glory and honor than Moses. But why does he have more honor and glory than verse 5? Now, Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant. Servants never have more glory than the owner. As a servant, to testify the things that were to be spoken of later. So what Moses did, what Moses was faithful for, was all that was going to come after Moses. Everything in the Old Testament, everything in the New Testament. He pointed to all the things that God was going to do later after he went away. After he wrote the Pentateuch. Verse 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. You see that? You see what? Jesus has got way more honor and glory than, than Moses. Because Moses was just a servant. Jesus is the son of the owner of everything. Moses is not. Moses was a faithful servant. Yes. But Jesus is given more honor as a son. And we are his house. Now, that's why I would kind of think that we're, he's not talking about the temple. He's not talking about the tabernacle. He's not talking about the priestly function that Moses might have. He's talking about God's current household. We are a part of God's household. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and boasting in our hope. Here's one of those passages that is a a difficult passage to interpret in the English. But when you understand the original language, you're going to see this in just a second, it becomes crystal clear. What is he saying? There are some that say, see, right there it says that if you don't hold fast your confession of faith or boasting, then you're not part of God's house. So what is he saying? One commentator wrote these words. The conditional clause, if we hold fast, means that, we, that the holding fast shows who God's people are. There is simply not enough information in this verse, or in the paragraph for that matter, 
to interpret these words to mean that the failure to hold on to uh, would result in an individual's loss of salvation. He is not talking about if you give up your, your statement of faith, your, your profession of faith, then, then you're not a Christian anymore. He's not saying that. In the Greek language, there are four what's called uh, conditional sentences or conditional clauses. There's four. This is a, a first-class conditional sentence. This is true because this is true. Okay, so he's going to make a statement, then he's going to say, if this is true, if or when this is true. There is another, there are three other kinds of uh, conditional sentences, but this one is just a statement of fact. This is true because this is true. First part, uh, it says that a first class conditional sentence means that the first part is true when the second part is true. Again, notice that the author is using the plural pronoun, we, if we hold fast, we are the household of God. If we hold fast, we, not an individual, all right? Now he's going to go on to, not only are, is Jesus more superior than Moses, but now he's going to talk about a superior rest. So in verse number seven, he's going to compare what happened in the Exodus And what Moses did in the Exodus and what the children of Israel did in the Exodus to what Moses and the Son of God have done and what they proclaim, what what we need to heed the warning of what happened in the Exodus. Many of you know that what happened in the Exodus, you know, they had been in the, in the, they had been, Israel had been taken to Egypt for 400 and some years, 430 years about, Okay. For the last 200 years, they were in slavery of that 400 and some years. You would think by the time God says, okay, it's time to go back home, get out of this slavery, and we're going to take you back to the promised land that I promised Moses, uh, excuse me, promised, uh, yeah, promised Moses, promised, you know, uh, uh, Joseph, yeah, there we go, I got to get the name, Abraham and Joseph then we're going to get you back to where you belong. You'd think that they would be satisfied. You'd think that they would be thrilled. But what happens? They start going on the journey, and they begin complaining. They begin fussing. They begin whining. And so he says, don't go that direction. The rest that Moses promised and what God was promising the children of Israel through Moses was the rest of the promised land. You no longer have to work and make your own bricks and then make and, and gather your own material for your bricks. I'm going to bring you into a land that flows with milk and honey. You're going to have rest when you go into this land. But that's not what they, uh, that were, that was their attitude. He is going to quote from Psalm 95 throughout the rest of this chapter. So in verses 7 through 11, he's actually going to quote Psalm 95 7 through 11, where it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, so the Holy Spirit says just like God says. Take that for what it means. Today, if you hear his voice, and do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That was an exact quote from Psalm 95. People of God have always been encouraged to follow the example of Christ. Follow the example of the disciples. Be faithful. They were always discouraged from following the example of these ancient Hebrews who turned from a loving God who had taken them out with power and miracles and the plagues and all of the things that God had shown them that he would provide for them over and over and over again. Don't follow that example of those complaining Hebrews. Don't follow that. Because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, we're going to read this in a little bit. 
Because we're told to make every effort to enter the rest so that no one will perish by the following of the example of their disobedience. The rest that was equated to Moses was the promised land. But the rest that he's going to talk about here in just a little bit is the rest that we find in the new birth of salvation in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but people today, we struggle struggle with rest. I struggle with rest at times. I'll wake up in the middle of the night with either leg cramps or worried about something or thinking about something, and I think you probably are the same way. We struggle with rest today. And I'm not talking about just sleep. I'm talking about having a peace, a confidence that God is going to work out whatever we're going through. He is going to take care of it because he's a loving father. People today are stressed, though. They're tired. They're, they're, they become desperate for rest. And the national statistic says 48% of the people, of, of all people, claim that they use some over-the-counter sleep aid several times a week just to get some rest. I don't know if you're in that category or not, but you're so wired, you're so worried, you're so stressed about whatever was going on in your life that you need something to help you rest. The rest that he's going to talk about here is the rest that's found in Jesus, and it's not just salvation rest for a future heavenly home, it's rest for right now. It's rest for today. We can have the confidence, the peace that comes today by knowing Christ loves us. All right, in verse 12, he says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be, any, be in you any uh, evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away. By the way, that is the word, that word lead, uh, fall away, is the word that we get apostate from. So that is the word. From a living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by a deceitfulness of sin. There, he's getting very specific, isn't he? For the most part, he's been talking about we, we, but now he's talking about you individually. You can have an individual hardened heart. You can be deceitful, uh, have a deceitful heart. You can have an evil heart. You. Now it's personal, individual. This is the second, by the way, of the hard, unbelieving warnings found in the book of Hebrews. And this one clearly is much more stern than the first one. The first one warned about just drifting away from the truth. Now he's talking about be careful, watch out, don't be a grumbler, a complainer, don't have a hard heart. Don't do this. It's much stronger. The first one was flavored. This one here is more right at their face. For the first time, though, in Hebrews, the writer acknowledges the importance of corporate worship. Do you see that? The importance of, as Christians, we cannot do life alone. We need each other to encourage one another. As long as it's today, encourage one another is what he said back there in verse 12 and 13. That we need, every, we need to exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. That's one of the benefits of being in a church. That we can encourage one another. We can, in, we can not only encourage, but we can challenge one another when we start drifting. Verse 14, another one of those difficult passages, but let's see what it says. There's an if there again, for we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold to our original confidence firm to the end. Oh, see, some people would say, see, you're only a Christian if you remain faithful to the end. That's not what it says in the original language. The original language does not support that. That would be a third-class conditional sentence. This is true. Third-class conditional sentences say, this is true only if this is true. Only if. That's not what this is. This is a simple first-class conditional sentence. This is true because this is true. This is true 
This is true. They are equal. We have come to share Christ because, or when indeed, we hold to our original confidence firmly to the end. The structure, again, is a first-class conditional sentence. It's not third-class. It, you, cannot, you cannot make it conditional that this is only true if this is only true. Because that's not the way it's supported in the original language. To remain faithful to the Lord marks the difference between a person just professing Christ and actually possessing Christ. There are people that would claim, oh, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. And four or five years after they make that profession, where are they at? They've, they've gone somewhere off into oblivion. They're no longer serving Christ. They're no longer praying. They're no longer reading their Bible. And this is what this passage is saying. You can make a profession and it just be words. Here's what we need to understand as Christians. The sinner's prayer doesn't save anyone. It is a believing heart that saves. Someone who trusts Christ and says, you know what? I have given up on doing it myself. I cannot make it to God. I cannot be good enough. I cannot be righteous enough. I surrender everything to Christ. He is my salvation. He is the one who loved me and died on the cross for me. And the only way that I am right in his eyes is by me trusting in him. So it's not the prayer that saves somebody. It's that confidence, that trust of knowing that he is the one who made it all possible. Remaining faithful then is a clear evidence that this is true because this is true. Now, I don't know about you, though. I love what God has done in my life. Don't you? But are there days, are there not days and seasons of your life that you feel a lot more like those ancient Hebrews? And you're whining and complaining about, God, you're not doing this, and you're not doing fast enough. You're not moving in my timeline. You know, I've been praying for this thing for the last three years, and you're not moving fast enough. Why not just move you capable of doing those things? Have you ever made a list of complaints to God? Have you? Now, I know, I know that might sound a little sacrilegious. I understand that might seem that way. I want to ask you a question. Do you think God already knows our complaints? So writing them down isn't a revelation to him, is it? You know, we write it down, God saw that. No, he already knew that. I'm just making it a confession to myself. God, you're not working fast enough. God, you're not answering this prayer. Maybe it's, you know, a prayer request that wasn't answered the way we thought it should be. Maybe it's a relationship that we lose that we thought was, you know, going to be everlasting. Maybe it's a death of a loved one. Maybe it's the death of a dream or something that you hope for that just clearly is not going to come to pass. Bitterness and complaining can eventually turn into unbelief. Do you know that? That's exactly what happened to those ancient Hebrews. They began complaining and getting bitter, and pretty soon they said, these things that Aaron made, they're the gods that took us out of Egypt. Now, that's pretty far unbelief, rather than God showing himself over and over again that he was able to care for them. You know, Jesus has gone through everything that we've gone through and then some. I think he understands our disappointment, our temptation, our betrayal. He, I think he understands the feeling of anger and suffering and frustration. And I think he can understand and relate to every one of those. So it might not be a bad idea to write out those list of complaints and say, you know what, I'm putting it on the table here, Lord, but I'm also going to leave them with you because he's big enough to take those worries. He's big enough to take those hard questions and those complaints. And I think sometimes we think, if I complain to God, then the world is going to, you know, the world is going to fall down on me. I don't think God does that. I think God kind of smiles and says, oh, if you only knew my beloved child. It's okay. I understand you're hurting. I understand you're disappointed. But I still love you. All right, to reinforce, uh, let's go in verse number 15. 
As it is said today, if you hear his voice and do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, again, Psalm 95, he goes on to say this, for who are those who heard and yet rebelled? He's going to ask a series of rhetorical questions. Who are those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt uh, led by Moses? In whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And in whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? The answer is those unbelieving Hebrews, right? Those, that's the answer to all those questions. But then he says, okay, that's their example. See, we, we, so see, we, that, uh, sorry, so we see that we are unable to enter because of unbelief. Their, their life exem, example, exemplified that if we have unbelief, we can't have rest. You know, here's the thing I found about unbelief. Faith takes God at his word. Unbelief demands more and more and more and more evidence that God is real. God had proven himself over and over and over again that he was more than capable of taking care of those Hebrews. And what do they kept asking? Another sign. Another proof. Show us more. Can you not take care of us? They got, to the wilderness, they got to the edge of the promised land, and what do they do? They send in 12 spies. Ten of them come back and say, oh, we can't do it. And what do they do? What does the Hebrews do? Well, we can't do it. God had shown them that he could divide a Red Sea, that he could lead them by a pillar of fire by night. He could destroy the army of Egypt. He could, he could feed them. He could, he could take care of them in every way possible, and yet they demanded more and more and more evidence. Unbelief never has enough proof. Now we get to chapter 4, and the author is going to make a point of this. You want God's rest, then it's going to require a response. You can't just get it by saying, okay, I'll take it. No, you, you've got to make an effort for this. There's personal responses required. First, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise to enter into his rest stands, let us fear lest any of you, okay, now he's getting personal, should seem to have failed to reach it. For the good news came, that's the gospel, that's the same word as gospel, for the good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not, unified, uh, they were not un united by faith with those who listened. For we have believed, for we who have believed enter that rest. When we trust, when we believe in, in Christ, in Jesus, we enter into that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he, he has somewhere spoken. Again, he's using figurative language here. Clearly, God's word has spoken this. For he somewhere has spoken on the seventh day in this way, for God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, there, since therefore, it remains it, for uh, some to enter, in, enter it, those who have formerly received the good news fail to enter, it, enter because of disobedience. And again, he is appointed at, at a certain day. Today, saying, through David, so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. Again, like any good preacher, he's repeating himself. He's repeating himself to make a point. Don't harden your heart. Don't go down that same path that those ancient Hebrews did. Only through belief, only through trusting in Christ, and we enter into God's rest. Verse number eight. For if Joshua, another one of those ancient heroes of those Hebrews, for if Joshua had given them rest when they entered into, finally did go into the promised land, God would have not spoken, uh, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. 
For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did, in, did for his. Let us, therefore, strive. There's, there's the command. Strive. Do everything possible to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Have you ever thought about that? Unbelief is a form of disobedience, especially when God has proven himself over and over and over again. It is disobedient not to believe him. During Joshua's day, during David's day, clearly Israel as a nation experienced some national rest. There wasn't a whole lot of turmoil during David and Solomon's day. But what he's talking about here is a permanent rest that's only found through the completed work of Christ, our Savior. By the way, some people think that they have to strive and keep working and working and working to maintain their salvation. But what did Paul say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8? For by grace are we saved through faith. It is not of your our own doing. It is a gift of God, not, of, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. There are those that think they have to keep maintaining their salvation or they're going to lose it. That's not, that's not compatible with what we just read in Hebrews. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now do not, uh, not only in my presence, but so much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. There's God's work. God who's worked in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. All right, now we come to one of the famous passages in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Many of you know this one. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, of dis of, of, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's off, it's, it's, no doubt many of you know that Hebrews 4.12 passage. But it's tied to Hebrews 4.13, and it's also tied to everything else that I've just talked about in chapter 3 and chapter 4. The context of that passage is an unbelieving heart, a hardened heart, an evil heart. One day we will all stand before God. In this passage, what it's clearly saying is, one day we will all be exposed for our heart condition. And our heart condition will be exposed because God's word, God's word will just open it up. It'll just cut it wide open, and then we'll know. He'll know. Everyone will know what we think and how we feel, what we believe and what we don't believe. That's what this passage, that's what the text, context of this passage is all about now clearly it applies much broader than that but what he's talking about here is standing before god one day and like a judgment seat and he's talking about how that one day god's word is going to be opened up and we'll be exposed that's why he uses the word we'll be all will be naked and exposed to his eye to the eyes of him um, to whom we must give an account that's chapter thir uh, verse 13 all right, so let me draw this message to a conclusion. I've got to relate it to tomorrow, our Independence Day. And while our national Independence Day, the 4th of July, that we celebrate our, our independence, our freedom, the freedoms that we enjoy in this country to worship, to, to you, know, you know, all those things that we have in our country, those are phenomenal, those are amazing all you got to do is travel around this world and see that what we have in this country is pretty unique when it comes to freedoms that we have. But none of those are even close to the superiority of freedom that we have in Christ. What we have in Christ is that he loves us. He is a loving father. He cares for us no matter what we go through. We're, we're his. He is going to watch over us. He is going to provide for us. And within that freedom of being a family member in God's household, we have more freedom than we have in this country. The question is, have you trusted him as that? 
Are you still working? Are you still striving? Are you still struggling in life? Have you found that peace that Paul talks about surpasses all understanding? It's only available in a relationship with Christ. And then after we've even accepted Christ, sometimes we're, our life is all ter- in turmoil because we're still struggling. Have we relinquished our work to his work to meet that rest that's only found in him? I pray that you've done that. If you're not, please see me and let's pray. Father, I thank you that you say some incredible things in your word. And as we've already seen in this book, of Hebrews, the preciseness of your word and how clearly it describes what you want us to know and understand. Lord, that you are far superior than anyone else. And I pray that we have trusted you for that. And Lord, that you have a far superior rest than anything that we can get from a bottle or from a pill. That our rest can be found secure and knowing that you are a loving Father that cares about your children. Father, help us to cast those burdens on you and not go through life like the ancient Hebrews that constantly doubted you. Father, I pray that you will continue to do your work in and through us. It could be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen.